Hi, this is Herb Shapiro of the Dr. Vax channel, and today I'm going to look at 3D printing speed for a second time in two weeks. The first time I looked at this, I went to Cura, I varied a series of parameters, and I looked at the various estimated print speeds. I took the highest speed that I was able to obtain, and I printed this calibration cat. To be honest, I didn't look at the actual time that it took for this real print. I just looked at the quality. The quality was spectacular. A number of viewers, in particular Chuck from the CHEP channel, an, an excellent channel, I recommend everyone take a look at that that's interested in 3D printing, pointed out that it was unclear to him that I would be able to obtain anywhere near the print speeds listed by Cura because of firmware limitations. This caused me to start thinking about my methodology. And in fact, while the first video is a very good way to learn about slicer parameters and the impact overall, um, there is a more nuanced answer to the question, how do I get the best print speeds? In this video, we're going to look at the impact of slicer, firmware, and hardware on print speeds. So stay tuned and let's learn something together. Okay, now it's important to note that I do not claim to be an expert in the Marlin firmware or in stepper motors or in 3D printing hardware. Now, I do have a computer science degree from the days of the dinosaurs, and I've read a lot of firmware in my life, um, but I did not go through Marlin line by line to make sure I have everything exactly right. So these are my first impressions. Please feel free to leave comments, to share other observations, to correct things I get wrong. Okay, let's get started. Let's take a look at this diagram to help us understand the components that impact your print speed in addition to the parameters you set in your slicer. On the left-hand side, you see that you start with an STL file. An STL file is a common format used for 3D printing. There are other formats for three-dimensional objects, but that's the format you'll see most commonly. You download your STL file from Thingiverse or another repository of 3D objects, or you produce it from scratch using Tinkercad or Fusion 360 or Blender or potentially OpenSCAD. You then use a slicer to convert from the STL file to G-code. Now you'll notice on the diagram that the STL file is in binary. If you attempt to open it up, it looks like gibberish. The G-code file is text, which is readable. That makes it much easier to diagnose issues once you learn to read G-code. The G-code file, let's go back to the diagram, is then loaded into the firmware on your 3D printer. You do that by using an SD card, by using a USB connection, by using a network connection. The purpose of the firmware, labeled as Marlin in this diagram, is to interpret the G-code and then drive the electronic components on your printer. Those components are the stepper motors, the extruder, the fans. The interpretation of that G-code, while controlled by the firmware, is dependent on the processor speed of the control board in your printer. There, most of the low-cost 3D printers, home-based 3D printers, use 8-bit processors. Some of the newer printers, higher-end printers, use 32-bit processors. The processor speed, the configuration of the processor, the type of memory, these all impact your printer. So if you tell your printer to print at 100 millimeters per second, but your processor in your printer is not fast enough to control the components at that speed, your printer will just go slower. Now let's talk a little bit of theory. Look at this slide. A stepper motor is different than a continuous motor that just spins. 
And the reason it's different is it has the ability to move like the second hand on a clock in a very precise way. The way it does that is it uses magnets or coils that are magnetized. If we think about a traditional magnet, there's a North Pole and a South Pole. All of us probably remember that if you have two magnets, the North Pole will attempt to attract a South Pole and they will stick together. That's how a stepper motor works. In the stepper motor, a coil opposite a South Pole is activated, is energized as a North Pole. So you have a North Pole and a South Pole. The South Pole wants to move to the North Pole. If I de-energize this North Pole, and instead I energize the North Pole here, that will cause the motor to spin. And I can keep doing that around the circle. Now, if I can control those coils fast enough, I can spin very fast. When we look in more detail at the hardware components, besides the control board and the stepper motors, the stepper motors have specifications. Those specifications tell you how large a step is. So as an example, we see here in this diagram that is a 1.8 degree stepper motor has 200 steps in order to do a full rotation. However, stepper motor drivers, special electronics in conjunction with your firmware, are able to do partial steps. And so they can micro step and in fact get more steps out of a stepper motor. Now, in addition to the stepper motor itself, there's a gear on the stepper motor that's driving a belt or a shaft that's rotating. The characteristics of that gear and that shaft also have an impact. So as an example, let's assume that the stepper motor gearing belts, they're all configured in a way that it takes 80 steps to move a millimeter. If we want to move 100 millimeters per second, then we need to be able to drive that stepper motor at 8,000 steps per second. Our CPU, our control board has to be able to do that. So the combination of the CPU, the configuration of the firmware, the stepper motor, the belts, the gears, the shafts that we use in our printer determine how fast for a given instruction, move the printer 100 millimeters per second, we have to provide information to that hardware from the firmware. Now firmware, it's just a fancy word for software that's embedded into a piece of hardware. That software that's in there when you turn it on. That firmware has standard values that are set for various parameters. Modern firmware and modern printers also have something called EEPROM. That is modifiable memory where we can store these parameters. When you power on your printer, it will read the stored parameters from EEPROM and use those to control the limits of that printer. However, it is possible to change those limits. And in fact, we'll see in a minute that software such as Cura does just that. Now you'll notice there are three values on this slide in yellow, steps per unit, maximum feed rates, and maximum acceleration. Those are three key values that help control the effective print speed of your printer. We're going to see in a minute that you can override those in your firmware. But before overriding them, you need to know what they were. So the way you do that is you send an M501 command to your printer. How do you send a command to your printer? Well, I use Octoprint, which has a terminal interface where you just type in commands. If you're using Simplify 3D, you can just type in commands. And then there are a variety of other software solutions, uh, many of them completely free, open source, that you can use to send commands to your printer. I've had a lot of good luck with Repeater, which is an open source software project that is available for Mac and PCs and Linux systems. So I transmitted, let's look at the screen, I've transmitted an M501 to my Ender 5, and this is the beginning of what came back. The lines in yellow are for speed, acceleration, there are two variations of that, depending on your printer, 
and advanced parameters such as travel, maximum travel speed if it's set, and jerk control. Now you'll notice that each one of those is an M200 value, M203, M201, M204, M205. In addition to seeing those values come back as a response to an M501 command, you can also issue those commands, and that's exactly what slicers do. So we'll see in this particular slide that if we look at the G code for uh, one of these flexible horses, one of the high-speed ones, I took and I searched that file using a Unix command called grep. It's unimportant how that command works. And I found that within that file, there was a 204 command to set acceleration. There was a 205 command to set jerk control for X and Y parameters. And then there was another 204 command to change the acceleration rate. So Cura, when you are checking the checkboxes to control acceleration and jerk control, is actually sending overrides to your printer that override the firmware. So basically, that's the answer to an important question. The, is it Cura or is it your firmware that has control over maximum speeds and parameters? And the answer is both. If you don't check the checkbox, your firmware comes into play. If you do check the checkbox, in the case of Cura at least, it's going to send overrides down to your printer. Now, how does a slicer control the actual feed rate, not the maximums, not the parameters? Well, it uses G commands, G0 or G1. Effectively, for 3D printers, they're the same. For other types of CNC machines, they make a difference. Generally, a G1 command is used to extrude filament. So G1 F6000 says, go to this X, Y position, extrude this amount of filament at 6,000 millimeters per minute. Interestingly enough, these are per minute values. So if I divide by 60, we'll see that's 100 millimeters per second. Exactly what I told Kira I want to print at. Likewise, down below for travel moves, we'll see it's going even faster at 120 millimeters per second. Now, why are the extruder values in the G1 command so big? Well, because this printer is in relative mode. So it could be the last extrusion went to position 2340. Now we're going to position 2349. We're extruding nine millimeters of filament. If this was in absolute mode, these would be smaller values. Okay, so what we've learned here is how stepper motors work, that the control board matters, that there are a variety of parameters that impact speed. But it's a holistic system. So Cura doesn't know about all those details. They, Cura doesn't know what version of firmware you have on your printer, what the defaults are. So it has to make guesses. So let's see how that impacts print speed. We have here a table. In the first example, we have the horse printed at basically the defaults, but I actually slowed it down a little bit. So 50 millimeters per second, 0.15 layer height, 10% fill. I took all the other defaults. Cura thought this print would take three hours and 16 minutes. It in fact took three hours and 35 minutes. Not too terrible. This is a beautiful print. It's printed in Matter Hacker Build PLA. Next, I tried 60 millimeters per second at a 0.2 layer height. Cura thought it would take three hours and 20 minutes. It actually took three hours and 31 minutes. You'll see the layer height made very little difference. And that's because there are not a lot of layers here. This print, layer height made a big difference. This print, it didn't. Now I tried 100 millimeters per second, 0.2 layer height, 20% fill, acceleration jerk control off, Cura thought it would only take 135 because it doesn't know about the defaults in your firmware. It actually took 255. And finally, I took control of everything and I produced a print at 100 millimeters per second, 0.2 millimeter layer height, only 5% fill. I reduced the number of top and bottom layers to two each. In fact, it's too thin. You can sort of see through this a little bit. This does not feel very strong. I set acceleration to double the default value. I set jerk control to double the default value. 
The printer didn't bounce around it at all. Um, Cura estimated it at, at an hour and 18 minutes. It actually took an hour and 50 minutes. So what's my conclusion? Number one, we answered a important question. Is it the firmware or is it the slicer that has priority? And the answer is both. If you do not have acceleration and jerk control checked, the firmware is going to control acceleration and jerk control, and in fact, maximum feed rates. If you do have those checked um, and you set the speed up higher, Cura is going to send M200 series commands down to your printer to affect the in-memory copy of your firmware. Now, if you wanted to make those the new defaults, you would have to manually send an M500 command to your printer. So thanks for watching. I hope I clarified a bit. I may have actually caused additional questions, in which case, please leave a comment. Let's continue this dialogue. I learned a lot over the last couple of weeks. I hope you did too. If you like this, give me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, recommend it to others. Thanks so much and have a good day.